Now let's talk about the pH titration plot for a weak acid, strong base titration based on the Ka value of the weak acid. You can see in this plot, we've got Ka values ranging all the way from uh, very large for a strong acid, all the way up to Ka value of 10 to the minus 10. And what you can see is this region right here, uh, whatever the Ka value is, so uh, right around the midpoint is where, well, let's say this 10 to the minus four, uh, so pKa equals uh, uh, minus log 1.0 times 10 to the minus four equals 4.00. And so at the midpoint of the titration for what we're doing here, pH equals pKa. And so based on the pKa and the Ka, of course, you can go ahead and see what's uh, going on with this. Um, and this region right here is called the buffer region because you're taking some of that weak acid. When you add the strong base, you're converting some of the weak acid into the conjugate weak base and you have a buffer. Uh, you can also see from this that once you uh, get past the equivalence point, pretty much all you have is, um, or what dominates the pH, is the leftover strong base. So that's why they're all similar. And then the last thing you can see maybe about this is that uh, and we'll look at the Ka of 10 to the minus 8 here. If you look at the equivalence point for this curve, the equivalence point is always in the middle of the big jump. And so if we were to look at the big jump, we'd be looking at the big jump starting right about here, ending right about there. And so the EP for the, P, the Ka equals 10 to the minus 8 would be above 10 right there for the pH value. Um, and we've talked about how to solve for that. We've talked about how at the equivalence point, you've reacted away all your strong acid and all of your strong base, and you're left with just a solution of your conjugate weak base. One thing that's nice about this is if you have a pH titration plot, you can estimate the pKa from the midpoint of the buffer region, and then you can um, estimate from looking up, converting that into a Ka value. And, and I actually don't think I've talked about that. So let's do that. So if you want a Ka value based on a pKa, you have to take the pKa and do the uh, 10 to the negative pKa value. And that's also true if you want a concentration of hydrogen. And this part is something that we generally talk about in first semester general chemistry. If you want the concentration of hydrogen ion, uh, you can do 10 to the minus pH, and that will give it to you. Okay. So now some examples of pH titration plots for other kinds of titrations. We have weak base, strong acid. Of course, if you start with a weak base and you, so start with, and you add strong acid, the pH is going to decrease as you add that strong acid. Here, if we've got the example of ammonia and what they're calling the half equivalence point, good term for it because you're halfway to the equivalence point, um, uh, that's the point at which pH equals pKa. And just to be clear, it's still pH equals pKa of our weak acid in our conjugate pair. Uh, and then as you come down to the equivalence point, the equivalence point is going to be lower than seven now because at this equivalence point, all of the weak base is reacted away, all of the strong acid is reacted away, and you're left with a solution of ammonium. And ammonium ion, NH4+, plus, is a weak acid, so the pH is below seven. Now over here, we have a case of a polyprotic acid strong base. And in this case, you're going to have two equivalence points uh, because you have two uh, H pluses that you can titrate. And if we wanted to identify 
what polyprotic acid this is, the first thing we uh, would say is that it's a diprotic. And it's diprotic because there are two equivalence points. And then if we wanted to identify this acid, we could go to the midpoint of the buffer region. Let's see, so 27, so 13. We would say that pKa1 would be somewhere around 1.9. pKa2 equals the center of the second buffer region, so about 7.8. And these are reading the estimates from the graphs. And you can then turn those into Ka's and you could try and figure out what acid this is if you had an acid that was an unknown. And what about weak acid, weak base titrations? Well, uh, the question will always be for these, does the reaction go to completion or not? And one of the hallmarks of titrations is that the reactions go to completion. If they don't go to completion, then you, you don't have a reaction, so you don't know what the concentrations are of each of these, or, or it gets stuck in the middle. And I think that's not generally an interesting thing as far as gen chem goes. But it is interesting to think about, will the reaction go to completion? And what we can do here is we have a weak acid and a weak base. The acid uh, gives up a proton, H plus, to make ammonium, and we're left with cyanide ion minus. And what we can do is we can now determine whether this reaction goes to completion or not. And the way that you do this, or one way, there are multiple ways, but my favorite way to do this is we're going to write out a Ka reaction for HCN, which is always... HCN, the acid, plus water, goes to H3O plus, plus uh, cyanide minus. And this has a Ka value of uh, 4.9 times 10 to the minus 10. Then we're going to write a Kb for our ammonia. And just to give you a preview of what we're going to do, we're going to add up some reactions. We're going to multiply their K values and uh, similar to some of the things we've done earlier in this course. Kb and Ka always have water as the second reactant. That's how you can tell a Ka or Kb reaction. This time, it's going to make hydroxide and ammonium. And you're starting to see how these are going to add up. We've got the products now. We'll write the Kb value, 1.76 times 10 to the minus fifth. And then we've got some pesky terms here. We've got two waters and a hydronium and a hydroxide that we want to cancel out. We know a reaction that has all of those things in it. This is going to be a Kw reaction flipped or backwards. Uh, for that reaction, we're going to have the two waters. On the product side, we're going to have hydronium and hydroxide on the reactant side. There's our equilibrium arrow. All three of these, oh, let me write my K value. This is going to be uh, 1 over Kw equals um, 1 over 1 times 10 to the minus 14, which we can also write as 1 times 10 to the plus 14, not in the denominator. Anyway, so here's two waters. Cancel them out. Hydroxide and hydronium cancel them out. And what we've now done is we've now built this reaction uh, because what we have left is just uh, hydrocyanic acid plus ammonia goes to ammonium and cyanide.
And our Kc for this will be to multiply all these numbers together. Um, I'm going to do 4.9 times 10 to the minus 10 times 1.76 times 10 to the minus 5. And then divided by, since it's written that way, 1 exponent 14 minus, and I get 0 0.8. Eight six. So what that tells us is that this reaction does not go to completion. This reaction is based on that KC value. This reaction does not go to completion. doesn't go to completion. And so this would not be a um, reaction that we would want to do for a titration because uh, we would only go about halfway since Kc is close to one. And one of the things that we do for titrations is the reactions go to completion and we use titrations to find the concentrations of an unknown acid or the concentration of an unknown base. We also use titration type reactions to form buffers, and we would not be able to calculate the pH of this buffer. Of course, you could make it an experimentally determinant, but we couldn't calculate it. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to do this one in your notes, and I'll be looking for the answer. It's a very similar technique, and what you should find is that Kc is greater than 1 times 10 to the fourth, and I'll let you get the exact value. And um, this reaction does go to completion, which is good because some labs use it. But I'll be looking for that. Now let's talk a little bit about indicators. Um, indicators are species that, depending upon the pH, they change color. One of the most famous ones is phenolphthalein. Uh, it's colorless in acidic solution. It is pink in basic solution. And so what you've got here is if you um, go ahead and uh, have an acidic solution, it's going to be colorless. It's going to be very, very faintly pink at a pH. Note this. Greater than 8. And, but what you'll see is the difference between pH of eight and a pH of seven, where uh, many pH, more a strong acid, strong base would be at an, its equivalence point. So it's very close. And then it gets more and more pink as it goes. And we've got an animation down here that's just finishing up. Let's let it reset itself. And we'll talk about that. But this is a molecule, phenolphthalein, and what we're looking at is we're looking at how it reacts with base, our two hydroxides. So we're starting with this. We're having a hydroxide come up. It is taking that proton away. It is making this negative charge here. Then it is reorganizing. Still colorless, though. Then it is coming up. It is happening again to this hydrogen over here, and it is turning pink. That's why you need two hydroxides to make this happen, to go from colorless to pink. And for those of you who can watch these electrons moving, that is also a version of resonance, a more organic chemistry version of resonance, because you're moving electrons without changing bonds.